Welcome back to either state and local government or American national government. There's a little bit of overlap in those classes, so I use this for both. Uh, we are looking at the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. Most popularly, people know that it's freedom of speech, but there are five rights. Freedom of speech, freedom of press, religion, assembly, and petition. So there are five things that are protected under that amendment. Um, I have been a bit negligent, I think, in the past in that I've only, um, I've, I've kind of done a, a just a one-off thing, you know, where I've looked at the freedom of speech and then we've moved on. Um, we're going to try it looking at all of these rights uh, that are protected by the freedom of freedoms provided in the First Amendment. So, freedom of religion. We're going to start there. It is emphatically the province and the duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. If two laws conflict with each other, the courts must decide on the operation of each, says Chief Justice John Marshall in his opinion. Marbury versus Madison, which if you're in my American government class, we just got done looking at. So, we are going to examine why a society cannot exist without free expression. We're going to look at the wall of separation between church and state, set up by the Establishment Clause, summarize the Supreme Court rulings on religion and education, as well as other Establishment Clause cases. We're going to, that we're going to gloss over a little bit, since we've done a lot with the Supreme Court already, and explain how the Supreme Court has interpreted and limited the Free Exercise Clause. So did you know the Supreme Court in 1962 ruled 6 to 1 against allowing prayers in public schools? The specific case that dealt with this issue was Engel versus Vitale, for which Justice Hugo Black wrote the court's opinion, and he found that school prayers violated the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. So why can't a free society exist without free expression? Think about that. What is the wall of separation between church and state? Should it be there? If not, why? How has the, how has the Supreme Court ruled on Establishment Clause cases? How has the Supreme Court interpreted and limited the Free Exercise Clause? So, there are two guarantees here of religious freedom. Under the Establishment Clause, you are, there's a guard against establishing a mandated religion. We did not want a state religion. We came, the majority of us, from Great Britain. Anglicanism was the state and still is the state religion over there. Um, that was not something we wanted. We wanted it to be. Presbyterians, we wanted to be Anglicans, we wanted to be Catholics, we wanted to be Lutherans, etc., etc. And that's fine. We came over here to America for one big, re one big reason was because we wanted to worship how we wished. And that wasn't being allowed in primarily the Great Britain, but the other countries too that uh, Americans came from. So we also wanted freedom from religion that shouldn't be something that uh, is forced upon us. We have the freedom to believe what we want and practice that religion. We also have the freedom not to believe a cotton-picking thing, and that's fine too. Um, negative rights are also rights. All right, so you have the freedom of speech. You have the freedom also not to speak. You have the freedom of religion to practice how you wish. You also have the freedom not to practice. There's also the free exercise clause, and that guards against the government interfering in any exercise of any religion. So if you're not practicing how the government likes or the government would want you to practice, you can tell the government, well, tough luck. 
Uh, you can't tread here. You have no authority. Uh, now, there are limits to that. If you are, say, and this is a silly example, if you are sacrificing humans uh, in the altar of your church, at the altar of your church, the government can certainly come in and say, yeah, no, you shouldn't be doing that. That's committing murder. Silly example, but you get the point. There are always extremes. So you have freedom for religion. Freedom from religion. Freedom for religion. How to practice and not to practice, as I was saying. The wall of separation. Big brick wall. Church on one side, state on the other. They are constitutionally separated from one another. Right? The government supports churches and religions, or not religions, religion, in a variety of ways, including tax exemptions. Churches generally do not have to pay taxes. So the Supreme Court has had to consider many Establishment Clause cases that involve religion and education. And those have been interesting, to say the least. Um, so released time. Students can be released during school hours to attend religious classes as long as uh, the classes do not take place in a public facility. And that happens uh, in public schools. Uh, I just thought of an example, but it went out of my head. I'll come back to it. Uh, prayers and the Bible. So the use of prayer and the Bible in a religious way is not allowed in school or at school functions. And that's just the way it is. Student religious groups are allowed to meet in the school on the same basis as other student organizations. So evolution, a doctrine, cannot be preferred or prohibited according to its relation to a religious theory. So you can teach evolution, but you have to teach creationism as well. And that's the way you, know, you get around that. Aid to parochial schools. So parochial schools are religious schools, private schools, generally speaking. Uh, the Supreme Court uses the Lemon Test to determine what public funding of church-related schools is acceptable. So the Lemon Test was a Supreme Court case, Lemon versus Kurtzman, in 1971. It says the purpose of the aid that a parochial school might get has to be non-religious in nature. So say to uh, keep the building up or to buy a new boiler to put in the basement or something like that. That is not a religious thing in nature, in, in its nature. Uh, you know, keeping kids warm in the winter it's not that has nothing to do with anything that has to do with religion so the aid can neither advance nor inhibit religion aid must not excessively entangle the government with religion so the government can give money certainly to repair the roof so it doesn't fall in and you know kill students and teachers but it can't buy Bibles or Torahs or Korans or whatever it might be for the students. Uh, so they've also talked, uh, they've also adjudicated the Supreme Court on seasonal displays, putting uh, a nativity scene, say, out in front of a school, public or private. Uh, so Lynch versus Donnelly allowed the display of a nativity scene and the, along with other non-religious objects on public land. So you can do it. It should be non-religious objects. There too. County of Allegheny versus the American Civil Liberties Union. 
uh, prohibited an exclusively Christian holiday display. I remember seeing on the news uh, maybe a year or two ago that somewhere out on the East Coast there was uh, a nativity scene, and next to the nativity scene was uh, some sort of satanic symbol, and it was just it, it was everybody out there was all in an uproar about the satanic symbol, and the people who supported it said, "Well, why shouldn't we be as upset about the nativity scene?" Um, I don't know. It, the whole thing struck me as silly. That particular fight, that is. Pittsburgh allowed a multi-faith holiday display. So it's it's okay-ish to do this stuff. You just have to be careful. You have to include non-religious. You don't have to, but you should. If you don't, don't want to kick up a fuss and, you know, have to take it down, should include non-religious, should include multi-faith, enough to make everybody happy about it. So chaplains. Uh, Marsh versus Chamber, 1983, said it was okay for chaplains to open daily sessions of Congress and state legislatures. And this uh, this happens. There are prayers uh, most every day before the Senate and the House of Representatives in Washington, D.C. opens for business and even in uh, Springfield here and in many other states too. And I say most every day because the chaplain might be sick yeah, one day. So why has the Supreme Court upheld some kinds of state aid to parochial schools? and struck down other kinds of aid. And that is because of its interpretation of the free exercise and establishment clauses. And there are limits, of course, to the free exercise clause. You cannot take actions that violate social duties or disrupt social order. That's not covered under the free exercise clause. You can't, for instance, um, say, pick up a statue or a, a plastic figurine or whatever it might be outside of the Virgin Mary and throw it through uh, the window of uh, the nearest church you can find. That would be very disruptive. Uh, you cannot, say, refuse to uh, pay your taxes because you don't want to walk into the courthouse where you might do so and uh, walk under uh, the words, in God we trust. Silly examples, but you get the idea. You can't be a bigamist. You can't have more than one wife or more than one husband. Uh, you can't use poisonous snakes during religious ceremonies. You might say that's part of your religion. A reasonable person would say, well, that would probably end up killing someone. Uh, school children who have not been vaccinated. That is a social duty to make sure your child is well and can be uh, out in society with a reasonable expectation of staying healthy. So, uh, the court has found many government actions to be counter to the free exercise clause, like uh, Amish children uh, cannot be forced to go to school after grade 8. That is counter to the free exercise clause. In Illinois, at least, you have to go to school until the age 16, and then you can drop out if you so choose. Uh, ministers are allowed to hold elective office. So that's counter to the free exercise clause. So the reverend so-and-so can be the town mayor as well. Uh, unemployment benefits cannot be denied to someone who quit their job because of religious beliefs. So, I mean, these are, these are just examples. These things have happened and still happen in this country.
So compare. Thought I went over a slide. So compare the effects of the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment on the freedom of religion that United States citizens enjoy. Well, I would say that uh, it sets you, the Free Exercise Clause and the Establishment Clause, it sets you up pretty well uh, to practice a religion of your choosing or not to practice a religion of your choosing within the bounds of reason. For example, you can't have someone uh, go up to the altar and be bit by a poisonous snake and die. That would not be protected under freedom of religion. You would most likely be charged for murder or for being an accessory to murder. <coughs> so I wouldn't say that any of these, either of these clauses, rather, hinder, uh, but just, you know, make it so that you can enjoy your freedom of religion within the bounds of good sense. All right, establishment clause. A little review time. What do you think? A, B, C, D, E, F. F. The First Amendment guarantee that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. There you go. The Free Exercise Clause. I think it might be C. The First Amendment guarantee that prohibits government from unduly interfering with the free exercise of religion. A parochial school. I think it's operated by a church or religious group. B, it is. Secular, non-religious. A bridge should mean A, limit. And precedent, well, it's the only one left. So, D. I might look for these terms to come up on the final if I were you. Or if it's a later semester than fall 2022. Whatever test we have next. So the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause protect, seems to me, freedom of religion, since that's what we've been talking about for the last 17 minutes and 47 seconds. The Lemon Test evaluates if a car has a manufacturer's defect, so that makes no sense. So it's not all of the above either. So we've eliminated A and D. When it is appropriate to salute the flag, I don't believe we've talked about that at all. So B, what aid is appropriate to give parochial schools? Identify the Equal Access Act. Allows public high schools receiving federal funds to permit student religious groups to hold meetings in the school. What three-part test does the Supreme Court use to determine if government aid to parochial education is constitutional? My hunch is lemon, but let's see. Aid must... Oh, never mind. I'm wrong. I was wrong. I'm wrong 15 times a day, so don't listen to me. All right, aid must have a clearly secular purpose, must neither advance nor inhibit religion, and must not involve excessive government entanglement with religion. So do you think that prayer in public schools is permitted or disallowed by the Establishment Clause and or Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment? This is an opinion question. Um, so I'm not going to answer it. It's whatever you guys think. Okay, I noticed that uh, that the last slide, the information was from 2001 on, as far as the picture. I did a little better, 2020. Uh, couldn't get much better than that, but religious affiliation um, has certainly gone down, uh, as you can see, uh, unaffiliated. 
21 percent, 23 percent, 28, 34, 19 percent, 34 percent. Um, so maybe it's fair to say we're becoming a less religious nation than we have been in the past. Maybe. So that is that as far as religion is concerned. Stay tuned. Uh, where we go next? We've got four rights left. Who knows? I'll leave you hanging for a minute.